Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to what I can't imagine is anything other than the hottest day that Edinburgh has ever seen. Um, so I hope that you're not melting as much as we are, um, me and the panelists on this call. Um, but welcome, wherever you may be, to our webinar today on gender and parenting. Um, so I'm Vicky, I'm the co-founder and director of Philo Sky. Um, we're a social enterprise that uh, work to create more inclusive workplace cultures. Um, and we've had a, a very big focus on uh, gender and parenting over the last few years, particularly in light of um, things like the gender pay gap um, and trying to um, in, in make transformative change in those spaces. Um, so I'm delighted to be joined today by my two panelists and co-hosts, um, Elsa Clark. Elsa is a former high school teacher um, who now works as a parenting consultant um, and, and tutor uh, and has expertise in supporting children with additional support needs. Um, Elsa also has a son, Archie. Um, and has been working uh, quite closely with Barlow Sky on a few of our previous webinars. So, so it's delighted to be welcoming Elsa back again. So hi, Elsa. Um, I'm also joined by Chris Maguire, who you may remember from last month's webinar. Uh, Chris is a author and writer of the celebrated preeminent blog, um, The Out of Depth Dad, which chronicles his experiences as a stay at home father to his two young children. Um, and as I say, Chris has worked with us very closely in the past and was a, a speaker at our Managing to Be Dad conference all the way back in 2019 uh, when the world was completely different. Um, so who'd have thought we'd be here today in the circumstances that we're in now? So just to introduce our topic for today, uh, gender and parenting and, and why we feel it's, it's something that is well worth us spending half an hour talking about. Um, I mean, there's all different constructs of family and the, the evolution of uh, parenting within those constructs has, has changed uh, massively over the last few years. So you think about like single parent families, um, families who have same sex parents, um, adoptive parents, um, step parents, like these are all different types of parental, uh, parental constructs that we have. Um, and gender identity is not restricted to male and female either. It, it's very easy to fall into that binary trap, I think, even now. Um, but all of these constructs make it very complex and in, in the interactions between the family are different. And that relationship between gender and parenting um, looks very different now compared to what it did, say, a few decades ago. Um, there's also the evolution of, of dads and and fathers in their role within the family. Um, traditionally, uh, when we think back to, to how things were in the 70s um, and the advancement of second wave feminism in particular that, that really looked to bring in women into the labor market in greater volume as well, that's really changed the dynamics between um, fathers and mums and how those roles are seen to be uh, gendered. And I think there's some interesting stats um, that have been coming out from the ONS um, during the pandemic about fathers' roles um, and the amount of time spent with parent uh, with children is 50%, 58% higher than, than it is normally. Um, and also, I think there's other gender stats uh, around single parent families, which are headed uh, by over 90% headed by women. Um, so, so even in the numbers that we see, there is definitely a gender distinction in parenting. Um, so we're really interested in just exploring that a little bit today. Uh, for all of our attendees who are watching us live, uh, we'd be delighted to take any questions that you might have either throughout uh, our discussion on the chat or at the end, um, if you wanted to come uh, off camera and onto audio, that would be great. Um, but I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, but I'm just keen to throw it out there to my co-hosts and panelists, um, Chris and Elsa first, just in terms of gender and parenting and what that does mean or has meant for you. So Chris, maybe if I throw it to you first. Uh, the, the thing that really strikes me is that, um, that my, experience in, my experience of parenting is neither similar to my own mother's or my own father's. And that is kind of where we are, I feel, for many of us today, that um, my day-to-day -day reality of being with the kids 
is isn't what my mum experienced, nor is it um, what my dad came home to. Um, and as as a result of that, I increasingly feel that kind of that that, that gender and parents that, that, that there needs to be a kind of separation in our mind that the idea of being a parent is almost like a genderless um, kind of role. It's it's just a role that. Um, doesn't necessarily rely upon, you know, kind of old archetypes or the happenstance of gender at birth, really. Um, it's, it's a job to be done. And um, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's interesting because I think that so many parents that I talk to now don't feel like their own parents understand their day-to-day -day reality. And I, I know that every generation thinks that the last just doesn't get it. But I think there's actually some substantial change that's happened there. Elsa, anything you want to pick up on, on that? The things have changed. Um, I mean, certainly there are many more dads staying at home and that does shift the balance a little bit. Um, I would say that I am not the parent that my mother was either, but that's because I come from two generations of single parent families where, you know, my mum and both my grands worked. Um, and I didn't, I had no cause to think that I would be any different, you know, until um, my baby boy has additional needs and I, I can no longer work. Um, so my experience of being a parent is very different to my mum's in that I, I don't go out to, to a career anymore. Um, so in a way, that's kind of opposite to you would imagine, you know, what you would imagine, you know, my, m myself and my, well, my, my partner, my husband, um, come from that kind of 1980s background where a lot of mums were still at home. And it's kind of reversed yeah. um, with me. And I, 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 I would love for it to be genderless. <laughs> for parenting to be genderless but still in my household there's a very traditional split um and that's because my husband grew up in a household where his mom stayed at home and his dad worked so uh, yeah I, I i think society's shifting slowly but i think it will take a very very long time so you both mentioned um your role models there then in in terms of your own parents approaches to parenting which is mm. interesting um I I was raised by a single mum as well um and then various stepfathers at, at, at different times and um, so I, <laughs> yeah um, I think that, that that also sort of I, I mean it changes or it changes your view of of I guess how you want to be as a parent too um but that that gendered element I still think that we do fall into those gendered roles. Uh, you mentioned there about the, um, I guess the uh, um, roles that you fall into in your household. And I see that in my household as well. Um, particularly when it comes to organizing things with the children or um, like planning, like childcare in the summer holidays in Scotland at the moment and thinking about holiday clubs and things like that. Um, definitely falls on me whereas my my husband is a very very involved dad too like I would say that he is uh, takes on a much more involved role than I saw um, or was my experience of with my parents generation so I definitely do see a change in that but I still feel that there's a massive gendering of the roles that we're expected to play and um, I'm really interested to get your views on that Chris because your dynamic in your house is slightly different um, and you were a stay-at-home parent for a while. So um, what are your views on that? I think that we naturally kind of slot into grooves that have been kind of part of our society for a long time. So, you know, kind of on a very kind of facile level, I take out the bins because that seems like quite a male thing to do. But then at the same time, I'm changing nappies, I'm doing the kids' dinner, I'm thinking about 
our dinner for the adults in the evening. I'm, you know, kind of doing the hoovering, you know, those types of things that, you know, other brands of vacuum cleaner are available. Um, <laughs> but that sense of, I think that dad's roles can um, expand and, um, and that they are expanding. But then at the same time, I think that often, you know, kind of both, you know, kind of both parents, if it's to, to a two parent household, um, do sometimes kind of cling to the tropes of, of what, you know, kind of the oldie world, the idea of the types of things that parents do. And I think letting go of those are going to be quite difficult um, because maybe some of us don't want to um, because even even if we aren't living lives similar to the ones that we expected through, through kind of observation of our own parents, we pray, maybe want to just kind of hit some of the milestones that we that we expected for ourselves when we were younger and um, leaving bins may be part of that for me. Um, uh, actually, it's not. It's a horrible task. But um, <laughs> well, I, I don't can't just empty It's not. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think. Do you not think it's to do with perceived value as well? You mm -hmm. know that um, staying at home and looking after house and cooking and looking after children are perceived to be soft skills. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not. They're not held with the same value um, and in the same esteem as as other jobs um, and and you know I have to say um, I don't do the majority of the cooking in our house that's um, you know my husband does that um, but I think that the, the mental load that Vicky was talking about about organizing things and um, okay it's a school holidays the kids have to have child care organized it's so-and-so's birthday that that bill needs paid um, you know, I've got to do a food shop, you know, all of that kind of stuff that's unseen, mm. that falls, mm. I would say, by default, a lot of the time on women, or in your case, on the person who's in the house most often. Mm. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a really interesting point you raised there about valuing different types of work. And when you think about mm. the value of work, that's paid or unpaid in a in an economic sense, um, there's very much a drive in the society we live in to be contributing to the economy and to GDP. And we do that via labor market participation and work um, there. So, so the value that is seen from top to bottom, if you're thinking about it from government um, and policymakers, um, to the recipients of that is based on what money we are bringing back to the economy. And for any kind of unpaid care work, um, including childcare, it is invisible to our economy. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't get valued as much. And I think that you can see that reflected, we'll, we'll come on to talk about the impact at work in a minute, but you can see that reflected in, um, in what's incentivized in the workplace as well, um, and things like presenteeism. But that devaluing of work and um, devaluing of tasks that I think it, uh, uh, you can see as being feminized. So it doesn't necessarily matter who does it, but it's seen as being feminized work and therefore it, it kind of has a less value attached to it because it's work that has um, evolved from that time when predominantly women were in the house. And as you say, Elsa, that those domestic kind of um, uh, chores that are done still don't hold the same value today, um, but they have to be done by somebody, you know, somebody has to look after children. Um, and I was thinking about this, when I think about the examples of who is responsible for childcare, even now, when I think about how many male um, teachers or nursery carers my children have, have met, um, is, is teeny compared to, like I think in the whole time, and I've got an eight year old and a six year old, the whole time that they've been to either nursery or primary school, there have been two male carers during that time. All others have been female, which it, it's still happening today that there's a gendered representation that our children are being shown in who looks after and brings yeah. children. Um, I think I'm really interested in some of the kind of language around this as well. That 
you know, kind of even in the way that we refer to ourselves and to each other, you know, kind of like we were talking a moment ago about the value that's placed upon domestic based work um, and uh, the, the, that role, those roles are traditionally viewed as kind of female and that when we describe it to those two, each other and to ourselves, there's usually a clause in there. So uh, we go, you know, kind of, if I was talking about myself, you know, Chris, Chris is a stay at home dad. And then I, there'd, be, there'd be a comma in which I would feel the need to put something exceptional about myself in there before, you know, so it wasn't a full stop. It was, you know, kind of, and, you know, he actually, you know, discovered penicillin and has... <laughs> gone up um, Mount Everest twice on a donkey um, you know just just to make sure that it, it's it's important that we that there's almost like a balance to that sentence that needs to be kind of you know kind of despite is a word that we would use or you know it's I, I find it often you know kind of it's we talk about in similar ways about mental health if you think about the portrayal of mental health in in on the media we we like people who have overcome and so it's got to be you know kind of he had a mental health incident and now he's the head of a multi-billion dollar organization you know kind of we ex we expect exceptionalism um uh, as part of the equation we just don't want to hear about oh, he had a mental health issue and now he works in the garage mm -hmm. you know kind of that's not going to be a conversation that we have and i think that the language that we bring to it the fact that we feel the need to kind of big ourselves up because the first part of our explanation actually kind of pushes our value down so much that um you know kind of in in a similar way a, a man telling you know, his mates down the pub that he works in a nursery you know kind of there's going to have to be a really quite strong other part to that equation for him to feel comfortable to say that yeah, um, yeah, when you think about how valuable raising future generations is and what a crucial mm. role in society it plays, um, it's kind of phenomenal that we don't seem to value it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I totally agree. Now, I do want to move on to the impacts that this does have in the workplace um, and, and how, I mean, let's link that in with this value. Um, from my perspective and, and from how I feel about working in organisations. I think it is very different now, um, particularly after the pandemic. And you think about like on these webinars, the amount of time that my children and through that door, and I put a bookcase up against it today to make sure it doesn't happen. And <laughs> um, but it's definitely more accepted um, that the, that our worlds are integrated a bit more now. So I'd say that parenting and work is is way less visible. Sorry, way more visible now than it was prior to the pandemic. Um, but I wonder if we will revert to type, particularly as, as people start to enter back into the workplace physically, like um, uh, are not working from home perhaps as much. Um, and who might go back, what the expectations on presenteeism are, um, progress while working part time, which has been a persistent problem um, for many people. And 75% of part time workers are um, uh, categorized as women. Um, there's all of these considerations in the workplace when we think about parenting that impact um, who is able to progress. Um, and I'm just interested to hear your views on that. Um, whoever would like to dive in. <laughs> I'm being overly polite here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Very good. laughs> You know, kind of, if this was a, a traditional workplace meeting, then I would be diving in to to speak ahead of you anyway. Also, so uh, you know, um, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, there is this. You know, kind of, I, I I used to work in an environment where people who, when they were going to pick up children from from school or whatever, or, you know, that kind of childcare. There used to be this refrain of, well, thanks for popping in, you know, half day is it today, all, all those kind of little kind of microaggressive sarcasm, sarcasms. Um, and, you know, kind of it was felt that that was just kind of part, part and parcel of it. But, you know, kind of thinking about it, the people who were the recipients of those kind of um, phrases were 95% of them going to be mothers. 
Um, and you know, kind of, I, I very rarely Im- remember um, dads being in that situation, and there being an expectation that 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 would be the division of labour. Um, and you know, I, I I don't see that changing a lot. Um, I, I don't know. What do you think, Elsa? Well, I come from a background of teaching where you have to be in school, and and, and that's that. So in, in a workplace environment, I haven't really. I haven't really suffered the same thing. I would say if you have to take your child out of school to go to an appointment or your child is ill, it's usually the women that have to leave work to, mm. to go in and pick up the child. Um, and I can't see that changing either. Um, and I think that's... We have advanced in that we now go to work and you know things have changed from the 70s but the the division of child care hasn't and certainly from my own point of view I just felt like I was doing two jobs half half-heartedly or I wasn't able to do either of them um and I as Vicky was saying you know with career progression things like that I couldn't I, I, I couldn't go for promotion because my child needed me at home too much. Mm-hmm. And I don't uh, think that a lot of men would have felt that same pressure. No. I mean, I, I, I think that one of the things that has kind of interested me recently is that um, as a, I'm a freelance writer and I, I, with the summer holidays coming up, I, I've been going through a period of the last few weeks turning down work. And this is one of the first, I mean, it goes yeah. so against the grain once you're in the freelance world. Yeah. Of, you, know, you just accept work whenever whenever it comes in. And having to kind of, you know, step down in, um, you know, kind of in productivity levels, being aware that my free time is going to be so much diminished mm-hmm. is, it, do, it did make me think quite, quite a lot about that, you know, that, how people I've known in the past who would pre- predominantly have been women have had to do similar things around holidays and it's not necessarily something that men globally on the macro level have ever really had to worry about that much kind of ho- school holidays just happen and you know kind of that means you kick a ball about every now and then but mm-hmm. you know kind of the actual time in the, in the office hasn't really been diminished. Do you know uh, what the point is? Yeah. There is a- the, for men who do want to, um, or who, who want to take that greater role at home, it's harder for them to do that too, um, because of all the masculinized assumptions of which we've been kind of talking about and alluding to. Um, things like flexible working requests, I actually think, um, and I don't have them to hand, but there are statistics that show that men are declined for flexible working to a greater extent than women are, um, perhaps because there is that expectation, well, why would you, you know, there's less of a reason for you to want to do it because um, you're not the mum. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, your place is still considered to be here at work and that's where, that's where you should um, be performing. Um, and mm-hmm. why would you want to be at home rather than here where you're, you know, master of the universe kind of thing. Um, and it massively relates to me Uh, Chris when you talk about some of your experiences and some of the comments that people have made to you about that um, that there is still I think this legacy that a woman's place is at home and a man's place is at work Um, and it strikes me that kind of men would worry in a workplace about um, requesting that flexibility because so many people would see it as a quirk. It's, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the, the idea here, I've, I've decided to start taking this role and um, I, I'm sorry, in the workplace, you're going to have to deal with it. You know, kind of, it's, it's like, you know, I've just got into Bikram yoga. Okay, right, brilliant. But why is that affecting me in the workplace? You know, kind of, it's like, you know, kind of, all right, you're, gonna, you're doing what at home? You're okay, great, fine. But we need to get it beyond the sense of, uh, it just being a strange decision made by a, a, a small subject, a sub sub section of men, and have it as a realistic option, um, and one that men don't feel that they're going to be judged over. 
Um, and that is going to take a hell of a lot of, of change because realistically, yeah. you know, kind of men still define themselves by their role and their income. And mm -hmm. literally take those two things away what what do you have left what 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 are we going to you know kind of other than as i said before putting in that really interesting clause about climbing everest um you know kind of what what are we going to because we like to pigeonhole ourselves we like to be able you know give ourselves like an elevator pitch of you know kind of, of how interesting we are and without that we what, what are we i mean it's, it's a simple enough question but so I, I just want to spend the last few minutes sort of picking up on that point and thinking about where we do go from here. And there's, there was never going to be a chance of us even thinking about any solutions for all of this because there isn't a simple solution. Um, and I don't even think um, sometimes we're really aware of, of what the problem is that we're trying to solve. Um, but where should we go next um, with this this gendered idea of parenting. Um, and in that, I include, like, even today we've, we've spoken about men and women as a binary categorization. So, um, and we know that that's changing and evolving. Uh, Elsa, you've mentioned about the pace of change being quite slow and how, how long it takes to change cultures. So I think it will happen. It is happening, it has been happening, but it's just happening very, very slowly. Um, is there more we should be doing or that we can do ourselves or that we want to do ourselves? Um, what are your two's views on where we go from here? Well, I think it starts with, um, if, if I kind of tackle the teaching side of things and, and what we teach kids from a very young age, and you've mentioned already that um, there are very few male nursery teachers, there are very few male primary teachers, the, the male secondary teachers, they tend to be in traditionally male subjects um, for the most part. Um, so we need to show our kids that men have just as big a role in nurturing from their earliest years. So that is something they just grow up with because it is far healthier for them. I think the mind, the mind it needs to shift from that, from that point, I would say. So therefore, Chris being at home, brilliant for his kids. With the socialization element of it that is so embedded, it's very difficult to, to turn that around and get away from this. Like this idea. Well, you need to be really, you need to be really conscious of it. Um, and also, Chris mentioned language. Our language is subconsciously gendered all the time. Of course, yeah. You know, the pronoun he is used far off far more often than she. And my son, who is eight is coming out with it, boys are stronger, boys are this, boys are that, boys are the next thing. And, I, and every time it takes me saying, no, hold on, stop. Let's look at the evidence for that. Is that right or is it not? And you don't necessarily have to challenge it in such a teacherly way, but, <laughs> but there is that minding your own language, watching your own language and not reinforcing these assumptions like, why is a bus driver automatically he if you don't know who's driving the bus? So, you know, there's all that kind of stuff that we need to start unpicking almost at a molecular level. Um, and well, I'm, I'm, a history, I'm a history graduate and my child knows about suffragists and suffragettes and um, is indoctrinated. So hopefully that will be in there with the bricks. But we do need to be conscious about the messages that we're giving. Yeah. to boys and to girls yeah. becoming more aware of, of <laughs> and the yeah. to play with our children, how we can um help influence that um great chris from your perspective i i, I totally agree with it. It, it is based around awareness and i think that that we have to really embrace the fact that as parents we are constantly molding the thought processes and the norms and the 
ideas of the of, of the next generation and that i'd say that it's so easy for us within our society to move through society without really this kind of lingering sense of awareness we just kind of coast we go from day to day get to the end of the day next day blah 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 and we we'll never really get beyond looking at the, at the small area that we we inhabit and you know kind of we we need to have that kind of zoom out moment um, and, you know, kind of it's so easy to fall into bad traps of, you know, kind of, you know, that I, I think of on a daily basis where, you know, am I happy that the activities that I've done today, you know, kind of uh, do I want my children to mirror everything I did? Probably not. You know, there are some things that were good, some things that are bad. And I think that perhaps what we need to be doing as a society is thinking about, you know, kind of how what what model are we setting and is it useful? What can we keep? What can we um, get rid of? And we don't have to be like this. We are like this because well, that's what was expected, but we can speed up change if we wanted to. It just needs enough of a groundswell to push. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, that's a, a really important point. That groundswell is what creates cultural change and legislation usually follows from that. Um, but it does start with that critical mass, doesn't it? And, and us collectively pulling together to make that change. And I think more and more people are coming, becoming um, aware. Um, we have a comment from one of our panelists. Um, Elsa has just mentioned that um, unpicking the language with children is key. Um, so a really good point to have made Elsa, two Elsas. Um, that we have on our panel. So is that just giving a shout out to our live attendees today, is there anybody else who um, would like to ask any questions or make any, any comments um, or come off mute to, uh, to share their contribution um, before we close? I'm just waiting to see if anybody raises their hands. Um, nope, in that case, I think unfortunately, um, we are called at, at time and I'm going to ride my look whilst children are still staying away um, and perhaps then go and put my head in a freezer. Um, but thank you so much. For this is something that I know, having known you two quite well, that we are all so passionate about. Um, and I think it would be great to continue this discussion at some point. So um, I can see us being back together for another discussion at some point very soon. And maybe we just think more about that critical mass and what it is that we want to do and delve into how we think about the language we use and maybe some tools and techniques for, um, for how to do that. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so much for joining oh, me. Thank you. Um, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much to um, our attendees who have joined us today. I hope you found that informative um, and thought provoking and we will see you again soon. Enjoy getting cool, everybody. <laughs> very much. Take care, have a good evening. Bye. Bye.